first want to thank everybody uh, for having me here today and to share a quick introduction as to what I do. As a visual artist, I collaborate with philosophers, scientists, and journalists in order to develop a more informed, holistic, ontological worldview. In doing so, my art becomes a research practice to investigate the world in an attempt to forge a deeper understanding of important ecological issues of our time. In trying to work with such complex subjects, I found myself having to make paintings, photographs, video installations, apps, street installations, and sculptural works to begin to communicate some of my ideas. One of my current obsessions is exploring the emergence of the Anthropocene, the name given to our current geological epoch. The Anthropocene is the human-influenced time, a non-anthropocentric period, as defined by the world's top geologists, stratigraphers, and paleobotanists. You see, we have left the safe operating space of the 11,700-year-old Holocene, a period of time in which civilization was formed. As in all artistic practices, commitment is imperative. On the day of the World Geological Congress ratifying the term Anthropocene, I went out and got a tattoo. On my right arm, in carbon black ink, I tattooed the Earth's surface temperature. The index comes from James Hansen, a former director of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Sciences, a climatologist and an activist, who in the 1970s noticed nobody was aggregating the world's surface temperature data of the Earth. So he began to plot. The index currently tracks from 1880 to 2016, and I've committed to continue inking it every five years until deceased. You see, the Kantian notion of the gap between what is real and what we perceive as real, what Kant called the gap between nomina and phenomena, today, between humans and the natural world, has never been greater. Meanwhile, incredibly complex foreign policy has been reduced to 140 characters. Our lives reduced to two inch by three inch images swiped and scrolled across the likes of Instagram and Facebook and every form of social media you can think of. The world, the real world, is becoming infinitely more complex, intertwined and viscous, requiring a much more sophisticated, holistic and trans-dimensional worldview. In effect, like a metaphor, like a great work of art or a poem, our world is irreducible, and it cannot be cashed out in the literal, reductive terms that have become the norm of society today. The moral and ethical consequences of this are enormous. As an artist, but also as a humanist, Sensing an existential issue at hand, I decided best to turn to the sciences to better understand what, we've, what is happening. As a visual artist, I needed not only access to the scientists, but also the dangerous, remote, inaccessible locations where they worked. So I called NASA headquarters and asked if I could join their Earth science missions flying over Greenland as an artist. Remarkably, on this plane behind me, they offered me a seat, and I immediately left New York to jet across the Atlantic to join the mission in the field on the tarmac of Kangerlussac, a scientific research base in southwestern Greenland. You see, unless you're an Inuit, a winemaker, a farmer, or a NASA scientist, you almost have no direct access to this climate change thing that the philosopher Timothy Morton calls a hyperobject, an object living in a temporal and spatial scale that is non-human. One of the markers of a hyperobject is that they are both everywhere and nowhere at once. You see, climate change doesn't smell, you can't hear it, you can't touch it, and you cannot see it. But flying with NASA, you can begin to see traces of it. On many of my flights with NASA, I would literally lie down on the floor at the foot of the pilot while we flew 1,500 feet over the expanse of ice sheets on eight-hour-long flights, so as not to miss a single change in the climate-impacted landscape below. From the cockpit of the Hercules C-130 military transport plane, you can begin to see firsthand the effects of our impacts. Here, the glacial melange 
calved off from the ja Jakobshavn Glacier in central western Greenland, possibly the most important glacier in the world, an ocean-terminating galloping glacier that's dumping 38 billion tons of ice into the ocean every year. The images I gathered, I took back to my studio in Brooklyn, which felt like a world away. Here's a work entitled Jakobshavn 1, a 16-foot by 12-foot picture painting that hangs today a few blocks away from here at the Norton Museum of Art. It's a picture of 110,000-year-old ice that had calved off the Jakobshavn glacier, but has since melted and is now here, outside, washing up, on the shores of the breakers in Palm Beach, yet preserved forever, depicted in its frozen state, in acrylic, on polystyrene, a substrate that doesn't biodegrade, is derived from fossil fuels, and probably passed through the hands of the Koch brothers that live just a few blocks away from here, <laughs> I note, as a material that doesn't biodegrade, the work will live on forever, outliving the very ice sheets depicted on its surface. The work become, becomes evidence of the past, for the future, while entering itself into the fossil record upon production. Here's another video I recorded from the pilot's foot on board the massive military jet flown by NASA's Operation Ice Bridge. Below, the rapidly thinning sea ice of eastern Greenland, a clear testament to our ecological footprint, while also becoming an economic business opportunity for Shell to drop half-billion-dollar bits into the Arctic in the search for more fossil fuels. Do you sense the uncanniness of it all yet? Back in the studio, the image becomes an abstraction, an irreducible metaphor in the form of acrylic on the surface of black carbon gesso on the top of an 80-inch by 60-inch aluminum panel. Both the polymers in the acrylic and the aluminum of the panel are identified by science as prominent markers of the Anthropocene, that we are here. These materials are our signatures in the fossil record. The surface of the work is unrecognizable. It's a painting made by a machine derived from a photograph of something ephemeral and abstract and looks like nothing you've seen before. The same way humans have not seen climate change before. As the saying goes, if you want to change the world, you need to change how people see the world. At this juncture, the pressure on the humanities to help us reimagine and better understand our world is immense. Realizing that we are inside of a hyperobject, the great ecological crisis we face today, and that most people are completely disconnected from it, I decided for Earth Day to create a free artist intervention augmented reality climate change selfie app that helps bridge the gap between the scientists and the people. The app, named After Ice, to connote a post-glacial period, uses your phone's geotagging capabilities, matches it with the ground elevation where you're standing, and overlays NASA's most current projections as to how high the sea levels will rise by the 2080s, which is in the lifespan of children today. The app visualizes, localizes, and personalizes the hyperobject of sea level rise, which is silently operating in the background on temporal and spatial scales, which are non-human as we sit here today. The app allows you to instantly find out how high the water level will be in the future, whether you're at home, at school, or at work. Behind me is the guy who created the internet, <laughs> Al Gore, in Vancouver earlier this year, demoing the app for the first time. The NASA projection shows that if only 14% of all the ice on the planet melted, there would be 37 feet of sea level rise, bringing water up to Al's head in that very spot. Using the app to tell us how high the water level would be in Venice, Italy, with the help of a small team, we did a guerrilla installation all around the city during the Art Biennale earlier this year. The installation begins to bring important information closer to the public's attention. Apple iTunes Store liked the app so much, they placed it on their homepage for Earth Day, helping us achieve 13 million impressions in the first week. That's this year. And the media picked up on it all around the world. I'm now working on version two of the app, which transcends the original, localizing more impacts of climate change, and I'm seeking an organization to help me get it built so that we can release it for the next Earth Day for free to the public. But of course, this is just a drop in the proverbial bucket, as many of you know. We all collectively live in a floodplain today, and a great storm is coming. 
A few blocks away from here, at the Norton Museum of Art, I have a solo show, museum show, which just opened, entitled Earthworks, Mapping the Anthropocene. Ironically, the National Endowment for the Arts awarded the show a grant, which of course comes from the federal government. Meanwhile, the museum sits across from Mar-a-Lago, home to the man who not only denies the existence of what the show tangentially addresses, calling it a hoax, but he has even suggested to defund our country's, our country's extremely small yet crucial arts endowment, which funded the show that is now in his backyard. Adding more irony to the fire, as it were, the show was forced closed the day after it opened thanks to Hurricane Irma, the most powerful hurricane in recorded history, clearly augmented by a warming planet. The museum is back open with lights on, and they have graciously arranged a private after-hours tour of the show for everyone here later tonight. Myself and the curator, Timothy Ride, would be honored to host you and walk you through the exhibition after dinner. I want to leave you with an unsolicited email I was sent directly from someone I met at the White House last year who had worked under Obama in the State Department. It reads, Hi, Justin. My last day at the State Department is today. The federal government is about to become deeply and powerfully unfriendly to the work that you do, not that you don't know this. You'll need to find solid third parties, NGOs, and international organizations that can showcase and collaborate with you on your work. Take care. That was his exiting email to me. It was a stark yet shocking reminder that the path I've chosen comes with great responsibility, but also great opportunity. If you know any human or corporation that would like to help change the world by changing how we see the world, please find me. I would love to speak with them, and I would be most gracious, gr grateful for your support. Thank you. Thank you.